it's uh, a great honor for me to uh, introduce Dr. Daniel Mueller. Uh, he comes to us from uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health in uh, Toronto, where he is the uh, director of the pharmacogenetics uh, research clinic there. He's also uh, a physician, a psychiatrist, and associate professor at uh, CAMH. Daniel did his uh, medical psychiatry and research um, uh, pharmacology training in Germany, then uh, moved, to, uh, moved to CAMH where he has ascended through the ranks. And um, I've had the great opportunity of, of knowing Daniel for uh, a few years. We uh, attend a lot of the same conferences and it's been a pleasure for me to um, uh, learn and, and witnesses, learn about and witnesses research over the years, which focuses in broadly in the pharmacogenetics of psychiatric medications, investigating associations with treatment response and tolerability, both on the clinical application side as well as discovery. He'll tell you about uh, some of these things uh, related to uh, drug metabolizing enzymes, perhaps some of his work in antipsychotic induced weight gain. Uh, he's an extremely prolific scholar, uh, one of the most highly published uh, psychiatric pharmacogenetics researchers that, that I know about. Uh, his CV is, uh, section for uh, uh, funded research projects is about three or four pages long, which I think is an excellent testament to his um, uh, productivity as a scholar. Uh, so anyway, uh, without further ado, I'd like to um, uh, have you join me in welcoming uh, Daniel Mueller to Minnesota. Thank you, Jeff, for your warm words. Um, first thing, I have to move the microphone down a little bit. Um, and thank you for the organizing committee, of course, um, for inviting me to this wonderful opportunity to talk a bit about our research. Um, and this is going to be about psychiatry, and I believe um, there are several reasons why pharmacogenomics is particularly important in psychiatry. First of all, when we look at the most commonly prescribed medications, uh, antidepressants and antipsychotics, um, they typically take a long time until they really, um, you know, f uh, exert their full effects. It can take, you know, it can take a couple of weeks, even if they work. Now, if they don't work, you know, you have another, another period of four to six weeks to go through, and so on. And so this is a long, long time, and uh, this makes uh, makes it also very challenging to treat patients with medications. And everyone um, typically has negative opinions about uh, medications, maybe in general, but particularly about uh, uh, you know psychiatric drugs. No one really wants to take psychiatric drugs. Uh, everyone has heard about side effects and is not sure what it does to your brain. So um, here, another you know individualized approach would help tremendously also to um, you know um, avoid side effects, but also to um, also to uh, increase confidence and, and fight against the stigma that these drugs have, because if they work, they really work well. The challenge is still to find the medication, the right medication, the right dose for the right patient. And another thing I just wanted to mention, because I was also very moved to hear Catherine Benson's story uh, earlier, um, is that, you know, like cancer, in fact, psychiatric conditions can really hit everyone uh, at any time, and there is an estimate that about one third of the population, um, you know, uh, has at some point in their life a psychiatric condition. So it's very prevalent, uh, very common, and these drugs here, antidepressant and antipsychotics, are those which are mostly prescribed in such cases uh, for long term. And really, um, I always like to uh, start with this quote from, you know, over a hundred years ago from Sir William Osler, a um, famous Canadian physician, who once said, if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might be a science and not an art. And I guess what it all means is, despite having, you know, good tools in your hands, ultimately, you know, you have to remain probably creative, you have to remain a little bit artistic because, as, you know, because you know well, very well that each patient will not respond in the same way. So it is still trial and error. It has been since, it has been in the 19th century, but it's still a lot of trial and error going on. And now, it's not that we don't know anything about the variation in um, medication treatment. We know certain factors that certainly matter. For example, age, we wouldn't treat a child the same way as we would treat an adult. We wouldn't treat an adult the same way as we would uh, treat an elder person. We know that, and we, you know, we take this into consideration on a daily basis. 
Um, we know that gender matters and ethnic background. We hear the, you know, the allele frequencies are varying between ethnic groups and again, hormonal, um, you know, hormonal uh, uh, um, uh, factors might matter, of course. And um, then we know that disease subtype, and this is particularly important also, because you know, we heard, for example, that you know, uh, not, not all uh, cancers are the same. You have to do, you know, you, do your, you, know, you will do your uh, biology, your histopathology, and, and identify, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, you have that type of cancer or this type of cancer, and so on. In psychiatry, we're lagging a bit behind because we don't really have good uh, biological measures of subtyping depression by biomarkers or by, by any kind of pathology. So, however, we certainly can imagine that, you know, not all depression that, you know, depression phenotypes or depression syndromes that we see in the clinic or schizophrenia are the same. And therefore, this, it will also be important to find a good diagnostic, um, you know, diagnostic classification um, here to, you know, to, to help us also then selecting drugs based on the subtype. Finally, and very importantly, drug drug interactions are extremely important and are often, you know, are often a little bit, uh, you know, I miss a little bit the discussion sometimes in, in uh, precision medicine that, you know, as if a person would just take one drug. However, the reality is that most people, when they're really ill, take a lot of drugs. And here, again, it's very important to also take into consideration drug-drug interactions because one drug might, you know, convert you from a normal metabolizer into a poor metabolizer because, you know, it's, it's, indu it's inhibiting a certain enzyme. So that's also important. But finally, why we're here today, I think, is mostly to talk about the genetic variation, which will contribute to, ex to some extent or to a large extent to the variation seen in medication treatment. And here we have, um, here we have, um, you know, a bit of a, a, yeah, pie chart or whatever we call it, a kind of categorization, uh, breaking up uh, response phenotype for medication and side effects into, you know, several compartments, which all do, which all matter. We have pharmacokinetics, which sometimes is referred to, what the body does to the drug. Um, which is, you know, metabolism of the drug. We do have pharmacodynamics, which sometimes is referred to what the drug does to the body. And of course, we have also environmental factors, nutrition, smoking status, and so on. Uh, we heard this earlier uh, from Pamela Jacobson talk about, you know, the, the, envir the environmentome and the, you know, uh, exposome, I think it was called. Anyway, lots of factors that will also contribute. However, we're focusing today also, be, you know, also to, uh, for the, you know, first for the sake of time, but also because, because they're so important, these drug enzymes, um, sorry, these um, drug metabolizing enzymes, because we very well know that medications are metabolized by these drugs, uh, sorry, by these genes, excuse me. Therefore, these are the prime targets to look at, and these are the SIP enzymes. Now, why do we have and why do we need these SIP enzymes? Mostly, it's a pharmacological reason. Um, any psychi any psychotro psychotropic drugs or you know, any drug used in psychiatry needs to ultimately penetrate your, the brain tissue across the blood-brain barrier, and it will do so particularly if, it's, if, it's, if the drug is lipophilic, if it feels well, uh, you know, if it's well, basically welcome in fat tissue and the brain is mostly uh, made out of fat molecules. However, uh, for the body to eliminate that drug, it typically has to be converted into a hydrophilic, which means uh, a substance which is, you know, dissolving well in water. And for that, they, there, there's use of phase one and phase two enzymes. And the phase one enzymes are particularly important here uh, because, you know, drugs really, most of the psychiatric drugs at least, go through that kind of bottleneck in order to be metabolized and eventually eliminated through bile or, or the stool. So, and good news is there aren't as many SIP1 enzymes now, uh, SIP, you know, phase one or SIP enzymes um, around that do, or that are important, you know. Uh, it's a relatively low number uh, when we look at them. And, um, and sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, going back. And um, there are some other enzymes as well that are, you know, phase one enzymes, but they play a minor role in the degradation of psychiatric drugs. Now, to give you an idea about how important one of these enzymes can be, basically, you know, I call it sometimes almost a monogenic effect of, uh, of SIP enzymes, I'm going to present you a little case report. 
uh, which uh, tragically happened sometimes in the 90s in the US and was uh, written down by Sheldon Prescon from the University of Kansas City. Um, so that gentleman here uh, was a 36-year-old male with a uh, history of depression, and unfortunately, because of his, his depression, uh, his, his depression, he um, he lost his job. Um, he was, you know, abandoned by his wife and children, ultimately, and then was was treated for depression. Uh, first with amitriptyline, which is a very commonly used antidepressant drug at that time, a tricyclic antidepressant. And then it didn't work very well, so the doctor said, oh, there's this new drug, fluoxetine, uh, take that on top of it, and you, know, you might benefit uh, better from, from two drugs than from one drug. Unfortunately, the, the patient was then found dead in his apartment six weeks later. And the uh, toxicology revealed that he had an excessive level of amitriptyline, uh, in his blood system, and uh, therefore the attributed cause of death was suicide. And it fit well with the, you know, with the story that he was alone, isolated by himself, he was depressed, he wasn't doing very well. So that was the primary cause of uh, death was then attributed to suicide. Now, if, if it weren't for the um, insurance company who wouldn't have now paid uh, you know, the uh, you know, life insurance policy, uh, probably further analysis would have never been requested, but in this case, uh, the, these were pushed forward, and then what, what was revealed was actually that, you know, uh, there was no capsule of amitriptyline in the body, in the, in the stomach, which would have been the case uh, in, an, in an intoxication. So, in fact, what happened was that the, the adding of fluoxetine has gradually, uh, you know, uh, inhibited the CYP2D6 enzyme, to the point that you know, amitriptyline could no longer be metabolized properly, accumulated in the body, and then most likely led to a toxic concentration, which led to, um, or which led to this, con which, which certainly led to this toxic concentration, which probably then led to the cause of death, which was cardiac arrest. So, not only is it an important, I think, you know, an important. Uh, legal case, but it's also important for the family, of course, you know, for the relatives to know that, you know, this this uh, uh, father and and brother and whatnot, you know, relative has in fact not committed suicide, but it was in fact, you know, an accidental uh, intoxication. And um, again, only through the fact that the life insurance didn't pay, you know, they, they were doing this analysis. And I and I suspect that there are many more like this, you know, accidental intoxications, uh, either through drug drug interaction and so on which we hear about all the time, you know, think about the celebrities, which, you know, tragically, uh, you know, are found dead sometimes also because of overdose, and mo most of the time, some, some kind of this drug-drug interaction might have happened, um, and therefore, you know, it's important to understand them. And now some people are born, basically, with a poor metabolizer status, uh, as if they were taking fluoxetine their whole life. So imagine now if you give that patients, you know, uh, drugs that they don't tolerate, they can have, you know, similar bad outcome. So that's why genetics is so important uh, to give us a preemptively, um, you know, the, well, the, uh, the, uh, the option to preemptively test and avoid those kind of um, uh, effects. So uh, as you can see here, um, this is, uh, again, talking about psychiatric medication. You can see that uh, if we take all the psychiatric medications and we look at, you know, which enzymes are important, uh, once again, uh, here on the left, you see that, you know, CYP2D6 plays a major role. And what is particularly important about CYP2D6 is that it has a low capacity, it's not very abundant in the liver and in, in the rest of the organism, and it has a high affinity, which means like drugs which are really primarily metabolized by CYP2D6 have to go through that bottleneck to be metabolized. Whereas, you know, CYP3A4, we have much more CYP3A4, it's much more abundant, and, and the variation is, is less, and, and, uh, and the affinity is also less, which means drugs which are primarily metabolized by CYP3A4 can sometimes also be metabolized by other CYP enzymes. So that is a particular reason why this, this CYP enzyme is so important. And uh, now we have, uh, this is uh, studies from Andrea Gaddick um, uh, in Kansas, who has looked at uh, this sample of 362 Caucasians and has looked at the variation of metabolic or enzymatic activity of CYP2D6. And as you can see, and as we, as we heard probably before, you know, most people are, yes, normal metabolizers, but then we have you know, two, two peaks uh, uh, right of it, which, which are the intermediate metabolizers you know, and the poor metabolizers. And, and there are the, you know, the fraction of these poor metabolizers is quite high. If you look at that, you know, it's five to 10%. 
approximately. Um, and uh, then, yes, we have a few rapid metabolizers too in that cohort. So these patients will certainly not do all the same if you give them the same drug at the same dose. And the drug is metabolized by CYP26. Um, and we have genetic tools uh, which can very you know, accurately estimate the enzymatic activity of CYP26. Um, you know, uh, even though CYP26 is a very complex gene and we're still basically trying to understand how the gene really works because it has duplications, it has, but it also has pseudogenes, it has remote uh, enhancers, which means gene, you know, gene variants far away from the gene still influence the genetic expression and so on, but still, um, we have tools to give a good estimate about, you know, if people are poor, rapid, or normal, or uh, uh, intermediate metabolizers. And to remind you one, one more time, however, it always matters also which population you look. And, you know, if a patient comes to you and a patient happens to be from North Africa, for example, you know, Northeast Africa, they have a 40% rate or frequency of being rapid metabolizers. So, uh, you know, you want to know these kind of things uh, as a physician because, you know, you, you, can, you can imagine that, that these patients will therefore show on average a very different response to what you maybe use if you treat patients, you know, from Europe, for example. And uh, the Asians here, the East Asians, have a relatively high proportion of being intermediate metabolizers, which again will matter because uh, they are typically, uh, on average, will require lower doses of CYP26 uh, um, metabolized medications. But now the question is, you know, this is all new, this is all not new information. In a certain way, this information has been around for quite some time. Um, you know, there have been efforts to do the genotyping for CYP2D6 and CYP2C19 for many years now, but why hasn't it not become more common? Why are we not doing it right now? And what is holding us back? So a few reasons. First of all, there is still limited knowledge of physicians and patients. If you, if you talk to the, to the average, you know, let's say physician, you know, uh, and you t tell them about these CYP2D6 and this, you know, genetic testing, most likely you will hear that, yes, I've heard about it, but I don't know very much about it, and I don't know if it matters, and I don't know how to start, and so I don't do it, and I don't think about it, and I don't discuss it with my patients. So the knowledge, bringing out the knowledge, is a very important uh, first thing that you know I think it needs to be addressed, and teaching teaching you know physicians and patients alike. There is then of course the question you know who's paying for that, um, and that has still not been solved in in, in most uh, in in uh, no country or so you know is there anything like um, uh, you know, routine um, paying for, gene, you know, for genetic tests of this kind, um, although discussions are ongoing. However, cost is a, pro a problem. Sometimes we hear that companies are feeling that they cannot really patent, they cannot really make much money because, you know, they cannot patent any kind of genetic testing because, you know, it's, it's, it's basically public knowledge. Uh, so, you know, uh, this is one reason perhaps in the past at least. And then, um, there's this outlier effect that many people will say, well, yes, but you know, you have only five to 10% poor metabolizers. How do you justify to, you know, genotype 100% of people if you just, you know, if you just screen out for 5%, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's too, too expensive or that doesn't, uh, that doesn't make sense. However, as we heard earlier from uh, Pamela Jacobson's talk, in fact, you know, uh, we all would benefit, um, even if we are normal metabolizers, to rule out at least that we know we can, we can uh, you know, probably be okay with standard doses. And then there is a misconception genetics, which I believe is also important, um, because when you talk about genetic testing, typically people think that, you know, uh, there's no other way around. Basically, you have your genetics, and, and you know, now a test has to be 100% accurate. If not, the test doesn't work. You know, however, you know, I would like to remind you that, you know, any genetic testing of that kind will still remain probabilistic, because, of course, uh, a drug is not just metabolized by one CYP enzyme, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not just metabolized by one gene, and it's not going to be also working, uh, you know, um, on the pharmacodynamic level um, on, on one gene or something. So we have to look at the whole picture. So what, what we can do here is to, you know, uh, basically become probabilistic and that, uh, and not deterministic, and I think that is something which we should always keep in mind. Now, um, we have started then a few years ago when I started in uh, Toronto to, um, to basically, uh, you know, uh, think about how can we 
um, start doing the first genetic testing in our patients and, and basically by that, you know, by offering CYP26 and CYP2C19 genetic testing, um, you know, raise the awareness um, and, you know, uh, see how, how well it's, uh, you know, how well this testing is accepted by patients and physicians. And, you know, they were free to refer us, but we would then give, an, give them an interpretation of the genetic profile, which they could discuss with their patients and come back to us if they have questions. And so we, we embedded this in a study because we really wanted to, you know, basically collect data first of all and see, again, uh, where are the hurdles, where are the problems if you, if you offer that genetic testing. And, um, and this was, you know, the first interpretations that we sent out looked a bit like that. You know, we had our SIP enzymes here, and then based on the uh, result, we would either say, okay, you might be a normal metabolizer for maybe 1A2 or 3A4 based on our genetic tests, How, and that would mean that for these drugs, for these antidepressants and psychotics, uh, you could probably, you know, take, a, take the normal, uh, you know, prescribe as usual, basically, and take the normal dose. But, but maybe for these drugs here, you know, we found maybe some variants for CYP2C19 um, that might indicate that the, person's, that the patient is a not normal metabolizer, and therefore we would caution that. And here, if the patient was, let's say, a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer, so there's a whole bunch of listed medications here that, you know, should be prescribed very carefully. And these tests sometimes has also helped, as we heard from physicians and patients, to, to identify, you know, bad reactions to medications in the past. So many times, Physicians were already having a patient stable on medication, but they were still interested to see if they explained, you know, bad responses in the past. And so the test was really, I think, well accepted. Then, in, then we started to um, implement this impact study in 2012. We added these additional SIP enzymes uh, for research purposes and so on, and have been collected patients since then. We have now, uh, uh, this is in April, collected about 4,700 patients. And here you can just see a breakdown of the, of the uh, diagnosis. Uh, the, uh, diagnosis is most patients had anxiety or de uh, depression, uh, which is, you know, the most prevalent psychiatric conditions are anxiety and depressive uh, disorder. So we're not surprised to see that most of them were, um, you know, diagnosed with such a condition. But we also see, you know, we also had schizophrenia patients and some OCD patients and other conditions. And here, for schizophrenia, we just looked at schizophrenia here for 400 patients, and we could see that, you know, still 70-something percent, 75 percent perhaps, are um, normal metabolizers for CYP26, but still, uh, you know, still about, and this is a very mixed population, um, but, you know, still about 20 to 25 percent are not um, normal metabolizers. So it's a quite some, quite a large number. Um, and then we asked the physicians, to give us feedback by a survey, how well the patient, how well themselves, how well they think, you know, the test worked. And here is just, you know, a brief answer was, for example, do you think that this kind of pharmacogenetic testing will become common standard as you just did it with your patient? And we had, you know, we had a good, I think, uh, amount of patients, uh, sorry, of physicians replying that they think that this is a good way to go and that they found it useful in the practice after learning about that. So that was that is our um, you know our uh, efforts at in Toronto to you know bring this SIP testing forward and to ultimately uh, you know hopefully implement it further. But what are regulation and expert guidelines saying? Um, you know this is all nice uh, research, but however, how well is this picked up by you know regulation agencies or? Uh, you know, by expert groups, who is going to evaluate these, 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 you know, the data? We still, we're still collecting data, so that means, you know, someone still has to look at the data. And I think, I think, uh, you know, here uh, in the U.S., we, we have, I think, you know, the great uh, opportunity to have, um, to have, you know, uh, expert groups like, like the CPIC, which stands for Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, and we're going to hear Kelly Cottle in a little bit talking more about that. Uh, you know, CPIC is basically also, um, you know, part of the PharmGKB, which is a pharmacogenomics knowledge base, and, and then 
there is these, uh, there is PGRN, the Pharmacogenetics Research Network. They all are a bit intertwined, and they all basically are, are you know, asking themselves how can we make sense of the data which is out there? How can we um, evaluate the level of evidence um, to, you know, to advocate for a drug or to um, basically to to you know, make recommendations when genetic information is available. And so we, are, we have been, over the past years, um, working on several guidelines on neuropsychiatric drugs. And um, while Kelly will tell you more about CPIC, I think it's still important to understand the concept of CPIC, which is you know, using clinical practice guidelines, which are based on the uh, Institute of Medicine, and which goes through this quite, you know, quite long list of, of quality criteria to really ensure that you know, these uh, recommendations and review articles that are being uh, published on you know, specific gene drug pairs, and the CPIC does it, of course, not just for neuropsychiatric drugs, but you know, all of these uh, review articles uh, undergo a very thorough scrutinizing of the literature, and then again are you know, dealing with transparency, conflict of interest, make sure that the, ex, you know, the expert uh, panel is balanced and so on, until finally you know, uh, guidelines are published. As an example, um, you know, there's a very, very uh, uh, really um, bad side effects from some medications, it's called Steven Johnson syndrome. Uh, you know, patients can die uh, from that. It's, it's, a, it's a skin disease, if you wish. And, uh, and carbamazepine, which is one drug which was originally designed as an antiepileptic, is often used, however, still as a um, mood stabilizer in some countries and, you know, to some extent also in the U.S. and Canada if, if other mood stabilizers don't work well. And we, we know, however, we have seen that, you know, through, through some research that uh, there is a certain genotype responsible for that particular side effect in use with carbamazepine. And that's a certain allele on the, uh, on the HLA system. And, um, and that, in fact, you know, when reviewing the literature a couple of years ago, you know, we found that the evidence is very strong in the presence of that genotype to not give carbamazepine, uh, you know, if you consider taking it. Now, interestingly, um, this variant is more prevalent in Asians, in East Asians. Therefore, uh, some countries in East Asia has also made it mandatory to, to do this genotyping now before carbamazepine is given out. And even the FDA now uh, has, a, 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 you know, a couple of years uh, made it as a requirement to do the genetic testing for HLA uh, before prescribing carbamazepine. Moving on, um, uh, Kelly and others, um, and Kevin, uh, Kevin Hicks, we've worked on the uh, recommendation and, uh, for the tricyclic antidepressants. Um, uh, currently, we're working on an update, but again, you can see that, for example, here for amitriptyline, there is strong evidence that, you know, if you're not for not normal metabolizers, not normal metabolizer, a particular poor metabolizer, to, you know, be very careful, because as you have seen the case report earlier, you may encounter similar intoxication effects much earlier. And finally, this is the most recent uh, review article for several and commonly used uh, antidepressants of the second generation, and this is about um, uh, the SSRIs, and here again we have, I think, a very nice, a very good um, recommendation uh, about that. Um, now, it's important, perhaps, again, to emphasize that groups like CPIC are not necessarily uh, typically recommending genotyping of the population still yet, but you know, in case genetic information is available, in case you know, someone wants to get tested, like, like people have tested themselves today here um, on a voluntary basis, then you, know, you can go to these guidelines and see what they recommend. Now for the FDA, it's interesting also that you know, for the, in their label, uh, in the labeling, they have a lot of antidepressants now listed here where you know, they carefully caution about, you know, if you're sip to these 6 metabolizers, be careful with, with these medications. Now, this is quite, quite a long list. Everyone who's depressed these days is likely to get, you know, at some point, perhaps one of these medications, which makes it even further important to consider the genetic testing. And then we have antipsychotics here, also a few antipsychotics, which are also important for sip to d 6 plus, you know, a few labelings on other drugs that I've listed here. Um, however, based on all that, what we have known and said about, you know, whenever a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer diagnosis has been made, 
I would argue that it's really, you know, it should be treated as a clinical diagnosis. It should be listed like an allergy in your medical records right up front so that, you know, even if you have another condition and you need another drug and we go to another doctor, right away, you know, the doctor or the next physician is informed that you are a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer, so careful with certain drugs, right? And I think that is really, um, that would really make sense at this point of view. Now, it's not about stigmatizing these poor metabolizers. A famous pharmacologist once, you know, in Toronto, who was chair of the pharmacology department, Werner Kahlo, he tested himself in the 90s. He was poor metabolizer for CYP2D6, and he wrote an article about himself, and he says, you know, he called it the rich life of a poor metabolizer. So certainly, it's not, a, it's not that you cannot have a nice life, but be careful, it's like an allergy when you get exposed to certain medications. Okay, however, what are the current limitations and challenges that we still need to face? Um, first of all, across, across labs, there is no consensus, no guidelines, you know, to, to, you know, to, um, to which, which genetic variants are tested and how they are interpreted. This is very important, and this relates to analytical validity. Uh, the genetic test panels are still, you know, that, that are used are widely unregulated because there's no FDA approval required to offer genetic testing. So companies are free to develop and sell own tests, uh, however, which might not have been validated thoroughly for clinical validity, you know, the prediction power that you can get through this test and the clinical utility, which is, you know, how much, how much better do your patients really do and how much money do you save. And a recent, um, a recent review article has, you know, uh, uh, listed about 22 companies right now in the U.S., Canada, and Australia, which are offering tests uh, for, you know, CYP2D6 and other enzymes, but, you know, again, very, very different tests and very different um, methods used. So then the next question is, what do you do when you have drugs which are metabolized, for example, by multiple CYP enzymes? What are, you know, how are you going to measure for these effects? And, uh, you know, we, this is like, you know, this is an example of what we have given out to our patients. But again, imagine now that some drugs, for example, amitriptyline, is not just metabolized by CYP2D6, but also by CYP2C19. And what, what are you going to do if you are rapid on one and poor on the other? Does it balance this out? You know, what are you going to say? So I think on the long term, you know, this, the, you know, the, tip, you know the best test that we can use are those which are kind of, you know, um, take into consideration several genes at the same time. And um, otherwise, the report become complicated to read, they become less user-friendly, and, um, and therefore we said we should, we should basically, you know, start looking into something where we have, um, you know, we can basically combine genes and maybe other variants, as, uh, maybe, maybe other factors as well, such as age, gender. The ideal test will, will incorporate demographic clinical information and genetic information. So. At that time, um, you know, this was the last time I was in Minnesota, actually, was when I came here to, to uh, meet David Mrazek and his team a few years ago. And we, you know, David Mrazek was at the Mayo Clinic. He kind of, you know, fathered a little bit the pharmacogenomics in psychiatry because he basically started, you know, to routinely test his patients in, in Rochester. And he has written this wonderful book. And, you know, he's made, he's, he's, he's made this nice... Uh, comment in one of, on one of the books, uh, you know, Daniel, I wrote this book for my patients or for our patients, you know, uh, and then, um, you know, basically here you can read the whole thing. And we started to work about and started to think about how can we combine, you know, genetic information into one good model. And so the Mayo Clinic started to work on a, on a principle here using five or, se you know, five or six SIP enzymes plus plus two other transporter ends, uh, plus one transporter, plus one receptor, and to kind of, you know, put it in an algorithm and at the end come up with, you know, uh, uh, basically a stratification to three bins, green, yellow, and red, which was then picked up by a company. However, you know, that, that model is certainly, uh, you know, a way to go to make sense of, of you know, uh, different data. And so we have um, started to evaluate that test um, and to use it um, in a, you know, uh, or a very, uh, you know, uh, a variation of this test uh, to, to basically um, evaluate now how well it is, uh, it is really useful in the clinics if you, if you move on to a multi-gene panel. And uh, while, yeah, while, you know, this is very user-friendly and typically uh, physicians and uh, patients like that, um, you know, there's still research that needs to be done because what 
What has not been done yet is basically you know, to evaluate such a test in a larger trial um, and to, and to you know, assess clinical utility um, and the economic benefits that you might get out of it. So we, st we applied then for funding, for a funding uh, at some point, and we're lucky to uh, get some funding to, uh, or, you know, to say that we're going to recruit 600 schizophrenia patients, 600 depressed patients, stratify them in three groups, you know, into treatment as usual, then this, you know, va this already existing genetic test plus an enhanced test where we add additional variants that we have identified in, uh, through our research in order to see if we can improve uh, that test and, um, and, and further bring on, you know, uh, implement further variants. And most of them are particularly related to side effects. Um, and I'm going to briefly, uh, you know, finish by mentioning which side effects I'm working mostly about it, and that is antipsychotic use weight gain. Antipsychotic use weight gain is a very common side effect treated uh, when patients are taking antipsychotic medication. And this weight gain can be quite dramatic. Many people gain a lot of weight, um, you know, like 20 kilograms or 40 pounds within six months. It's not unusual uh, with certain drugs, and particularly in younger, children, in younger uh, people like children and adolescents. And then, of course, they can develop metabolic syndrome and have all these problems that they wouldn't have had if they wouldn't take antipsychotic medication. And here you can see a breakdown of medications which are particularly at high risk for, for weight gain, which is clozapine or olanzapine. Now, you know, you may wonder, so why don't I use just these drugs here which have little weight gain? But unfortunately, sometimes these drugs don't work, which are weight neutral. Um, uh, and we have to go to olanzapine and clozapine. Particularly, clozapine is probably still the best drug uh, out there for uh, severe cases of schizophrenia. So here a test would be extremely valuable to filter out and to you know, make decisions based on who is at risk for antipsychotic use weight gain. And um, here is one finding we had, and I think it's very impressive. First of all, it's not, a, it's not common that you replicate genetic findings. And, with our colleagues in New York, we once, you know, they once had this GWAS hit for antipsychotic use weight gain in a small population for a gene which is called melanocortin-4 receptor. The melanocortin-4 receptor is a gene in the hypothalamus which regulates appetite and satiety, and so it's a, it's a very good candidate. So that gene variant, we replicated that in different samples and could see that it, you know, it replicates across, across other samples, and not that it just replicates, but the effect size is quite impressive because each time that you know individuals were carrying the homozygote version of that of that variant, they would gain on average twice as much weight uh, as if they don't have this variant. And in kilograms, that is again very impressive because you know if you gain four kilogram or or four and a half or or nine kilogram in six or eight weeks, that's a huge difference. It's a huge basically. Uh, clinically relevant difference. And so that is also, from, an, from, from another point, interesting because we feel that for side effects, as we saw for carbamazepine, genes can have large effects. So therefore, it is important also to consider genetic testing for side effects, and these are probably um, the, no, the tests that will become more uh, likely available in psychiatry for drug metabolism and for side effects. So finally, very last slide, um, we are working on a risk model, as I mentioned before, you know, combining genes um, and come up with an additive or interactive risk model where you would, you know, uh, consider people who have now multiple risk variants, you know, sometimes it's referred to as a polygenic risk score, and, you know, we, we, you know, we did that, and, and if you have no risk variant, you even lose a little weight gain, uh, you even lose a little weight um, in this model, but, you know, the more the risk variants you have, and again, this is a small sample size, very preliminary, but we were just curious to see how it looks like. You know, the more variants you have at the end, you know, you can, you can gain a tremendous amount of weight. And uh, this is, again, something that uh, needs, to, needs to be done for implementation at some point um, to, um, you know, to move on this, this kind of multi-factor genetics. So, coming to a conclusion, in summary, I think we've seen that we have robust data supporting strong associations with ZIP enzymes um, and therapeutic outcome for uh, psychiatric drugs. 
thumb genes, as you have seen, have kind of strong effects, particularly on adverse events. Um, at this moment, people often say, you know, the, probably the, the, the safest approach for a genetic testing, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're unsure how to pay for it and whatnot, is to, um, you know, is to consider genetic testing uh, at the latest when the first trial hasn't worked, because now you're more likely to have patients who are not normal metabolizers and, 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 and you want to, you know, you know, you want to make sure that, that these are now getting, getting more individualized treatment. I think, personally, pharmacogenics is perhaps the best translational model in psychiatry of the past years, you know, where you can see that things have really moved well from bench to bedside. I think, um, you know, for an academic institution, that is uh, quite remarkable. I can only think of uh, magnetic stimulation uh, therapies in the last years who have really made it um, as well out of the, out of the lab. And, uh, however, we still need to scrutinize existing tests and do more research, um, you know, to really have, the, to really have the, the best possible implementation strategy. And also, again, um, more trials that, you know, we're currently conducting. We need just more trials like that to evaluate the real-world scenario. And with that, I just would like to thank my uh, colleagues, senior and junior collaborators in Toronto, for their help, for their hard work, and uh, for their passion. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.